In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Hey, Tremendous Tuesday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. If you'd like to be part of the program, the number to call is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is one 205-271-2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. You can always send us an email, openline at EWTN.com. Or you can text your question, text the letters EWTN to 55000, wait for a response. Text your first name and your question, message, and data rates may apply. I'm Jack Williams, the uh, the very mature Michael McCall producing the program today. Your call screener is Matt Gabensky and Jeff Burson handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window, and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And uh, our host, as he is every Tuesday, Father Wade Menezes, and this is your final opportunity to ask a question of Father Wade before Thanksgiving and uh, before Advent begins, even. Uh, So I would encourage you to pick up that phone, uh, give him a call, and he is here, locked in and ready to answer your questions, Unlike this past weekend, when I called him to ask a question and he didn't answer the phone, he has he does not have that option with you right now. Thank God. So for this caller is a perfect ID. opportunity for you to call in at eight three three two eight eight E W T N. Father Wade, how are you? I'm doing great, Jack, and and happy New Year in five days. But before I explain that and why he just said that, I want to also say. Uh, the mature Michael McCall. I, I don't know if that means he's had another birthday or what, but but anyway, no, we'll, we'll, it means <laughs> we'll get back to it. It means he's. Uh, uh, what what does it mean? The, <laughs> well, the, the the incredible dad T-shirt with the big life size incredible Hulk image on the front of it is the most mature thing about Michael McCall's <laughs> behavior right now. Let's just put it that way. Hey, he, he's, he's a proud dad. What can he you is say, in a control huh? room full of electronic devices and he is, uh, He's doing exactly what you would expect a 12-year-old to do with a bunch of electronic devices right now. (laughs) And his little boy would love to be in there with him with those devices, I'm sure. And speaking of a proud dad, I'm a proud uncle and want to give a shout-out to my two nephews, Kendall and Jude, who are driving home this very hour from college back to Kentucky for the Thanksgiving holiday. And I want to tell them on the air, obey the speed limits, gentlemen. Otherwise, it's confessional matter. Don't you love having an uncle as a priest who can remind you of of things? And the same thing to our own Fathers of Mercy seminarians who return from the seminary today for our Thanksgiving holiday here at the Generalate in Auburn, Kentucky. And I also tell them, obey the speed limit. So so, uh, we're glad that these guys are coming home for the Thanksgiving holiday, and we wish everyone a very blessed Thanksgiving here at Open Line Tuesday. And I do want to talk about the new year because it's in five days on the first Sunday of Advent. You know, within the cycle of a whole year, Jack, the church unfolds the whole mystery of Christ, recalling thus the mysteries of redemption. The church opens to all the faithful, we say, the riches of her Lord's powers and merits, so that these are in some way made present for all time, and the faithful themselves are enabled to lay hold upon them and become filled with the saving graces that these gifts and merits from Christ offer to all of us. And so every year, our New Year's Day, liturgically speaking, it begins the entire new liturgical year, is the first Sunday of Advent. And so it is our New Year's Day. 
uh, because our secular lives, our temporal lives are called to uh, revolve around the whole liturgical year and to make our lives holy. And then, of course, the secular New Year's Day, January 1st, is another great solemnity uh, on the Church's universal calendar, the great solemnity of Mary, Mother of God, which is the eighth day, the closing octave day of the great Christmas octave, December 25th to October 1st. So how beautiful is that, huh? Advent comes from the Latin word meaning coming. It general, uh, generally means, that, for example, the coming of a, of a king to his people in, in older times, uh, historical times, and when the people would have a great anticipation of the arrival of their king or their representative or a notable person. Well, Jesus Christ is coming. And Advent focuses on his two comings. Uh, Advent is intended to be a season of preparation for his arrival. Huh? Uh, while we typically regard Advent as a joyous season, it is also intended uh, to be a period of preparation, much like Lent, uh, prayer, penance, and fasting are appropriate during this season. But whereas Lent is more about penance, Advent is more about a quiet, uh, reflective, uh, sober awakening. Uh, to the coming of Christ. And while Advent is not as strict as Lent, uh, and there are no liturgical guidelines, we would say, uh, for fasting during Advent, uh, it is meant to be a period of self-preparation and self-examination, and this is something that we should not lose sight of for this four-and-a-half-week season. Uh, for example, the, the violet uh, color associated with Advent is also the color for penance that is used liturgically during Lent, right? The faithful can fast uh, somewhat during the first two weeks in particular and receive the Sacrament of Reconciliation and preparation for the celebration of Christmas. It's one of those seasons of the year that's a great time to go make a good, holy, reverent confession in preparation for your Holy Communion during Advent. Uh, the color of the third Sunday of Advent, Gaudete Sunday, called Laetare Sunday during Lent, uh, is rose. Um, it's, it means rejoice, Gaudete in the Latin. Uh, this color symbolizes joy and represents the happiness we will experience when Jesus comes again. Uh, this third Sunday of Advent, then, is a day of anticipatory celebration. And finally, Sundays during Advent, just as during Lent, should not be given to fasting, but instead to celebration, because we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord every single Sunday of the liturgical year. It is important to remember, however, that there are no particular liturgical rules for how the laity should observe Advent, as again, it is not as liturgically strict as Lent. We do have some religious orders that look uh, at Advent as, quote, the little Lent. And so in that sense, again, Advent wants us to be uh, quiet, uh, reflective, have some introspection. How does my life mold to that of Christ, etc.? And so it's a devout and joyful expectation season. It focuses on the two comings of Christ, hence the Mass offers two prefaces for Advent, one focusing on the general judgment and one focusing on the nativity. And Advent is divided into two periods, from its beginning, the first Sunday, uh, of, of Advent, the first Sunday of Advent, uh, and then all the way through December 16th is that first period, and the second period is from the 17th of December through the 23rd, and that's when we hear the great O antiphons, the 17th through the 23rd. Huh? In the Liturgy of the Hours, they're used during the celebration of Vespers when they serve as the evening antiphon for the Canticle of Mary, and in the Mass, the O antiphons as well are incorporated into the Alleluia verse before the Gospel. And what are the O Antiphons? And I want to wrap up with this. December 17th, O Sapientia, O Wisdom. December 18th, O Adonai, O Lord of Might. December 19th, O Radix Jesse, O Flower of Jesse's Stem. December 20th, O Clavis Davidica, O Key of David. And December 21st, O Oriens, O Rising Star. And December 22nd, O Rex Gentium, O King of Nations. And December 23rd, O Emmanuel, O God with us. And remember that great Christmas novena runs from the December, uh, from December 20, 17th through the 25th of each year. For those who wish to partake in it, there are no specific texts for it, but it's a nine-day countdown from the 17th through the 25th inclusive. And although not specifically, again, penitential in nature, Advent is a liturgical season that is meant to be quiet and reflective and hence no gloria during the Mass. It is meant to be sober and awakening and anticipation of our Lord's coming. And this, too, is seen in the liturgy. For example, whereas Lent suppresses the Te Deum and Alleluia and Gloria during the Liturgy of the Hours and Mass, Advent retains the Te Deum and the Alleluia during the Liturgy of the Hours and Mass, respectively. And uh, let us remember what 
Vatican II teaches about the sacred liturgy and number 33 of Sacrosanctum Concilium, the document on the liturgy, quote, the sacred liturgy is above all things the worship of the divine majesty. The sacred liturgy is above all things the worship of the divine majesty. So it's a great time to make some New Year's resolutions as we begin the new liturgical year wherein your whole temporal and secular life is called to revolve around that liturgical year. Give us a call today. I would like to invite our Open Line Tuesday listeners to call in live and share with us what some of their New Year's resolutions are, liturgically and temporally. Maybe trying to go to Mass a little more. Uh, Maybe something more temporal or secular on your list. Call us up. Give a witness. Also give a witness of how your family observes the wonderful season of Advent. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Michael, Peggy, and hopefully you. It's Open Line Tuesday with Father Wade Menezes. A brand new item at EWTNRC.com this month is the Our Lady of Kibeo statue. Created by EWTN in consultation with Rwandan genocide survivor and popular host and author, Immaculee Eli Bagiza. This new statue is based on the church-approved apparitions of the Blessed Mother to three young girls in Africa. To order, go to EWTNRC.com and search for item number 747. St. Alphonsus Liguori made a vow to never waste time. He was a bishop, he oversaw a religious community, and he served people in need. He wrote about 60 books, and he'd write those books in little half-hour increments when he had the free time to do it. But for all his busyness, he would drop everything if someone needed to talk to him. And not just people who were a big deal, but anybody. And he'd have no problem spending an hour or two with somebody who just came by and needed his help. You see, he never saw wasting time on people as a waste of time. What a beautiful thing. I'm a really driven guy. I'm always going to the next task, the next project. I need to remember to stop. If somebody comes to my door, if a kid wants to talk to me, if a friend wants to chat, people come first. That's how Jesus did things. He didn't just preach to large crowds. He always had the time for the one, just like he does for you. Do you make that kind of time for people? This is Chris Stefanik from Real Life Catholic. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. Hot off the presses from EWTN Publishing for the uh, for the month of November is uh, Mother Angelica's In His Sandals. These pages are filled with Mother's practical wisdom as she guides you through Scripture and the writings of St. John, St. James, and St. Paul. That's quite a triumvirate. Mother offers advice on developing an attitude of gratitude and joyful living, helping others find God through our example, accepting trials as blessings, and so much more. Discover the life God is calling you to live with this, uh, with In His Sandals, A Journey with Jesus by Mother Angelica. It's available at EWTN's religious catalog. Shop Catholic, buy Catholic, shop EWTNRC.com. Got a couple of open phone lines for you. Grab one of these open lines at 833-288-EWTN. Somebody is going to wake up on Advent morning on Sunday, the first week of Advent, and they're going to wish they would have asked their question of Father Wade on Tuesday. Don't regret. 833-288-3986. First up today is Michael in Spokane, Washington, listening on Sacred Heart Radio. Michael, thanks so much for holding. Welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you, and happy Thanksgiving to both of you. Um, you know, you. it's raining and snowing in Spokane. We have up to <clears throat> up to three inches of snow north of Spokane. So, uh, but I have a moral question involving freedom of speech, freedom of religion. You know, as you know, since 1973, there have been over 60 million abortions in America since it became legal. And as a Catholic, I believe life begins at conception. And today there is a bill before Congress which requires taxpayers to pay for abortions, including myself. And most people do not want their tax money to go for abortion. 
and the Hyde Amendment would prevent taxpayer money going for abortion. And I believe this involves freedom of religion and freedom of speech, and people need to know about this and do about this. So um, what is your ideas on this, Father? Well, my ideas on it are the Church's teachings on it, and uh, the U.S. bishops have been very strong, especially since their document of May of 2021, earlier this year, uh, urging Catholics to sign any and all petitions against the Hyde uh, Amendment's repeal. Huh? Uh, the, the Hyde Amendment, uh, which became law in 1976, prohibits the use of federal Medicaid dollars for abortion, uh, except in cases of rape, incest, or when the life of the woman would be endangered. And there, were, there was no choice on that not being in there when it was put into place in 76. But w- we can surely stand strong in not wanting tax dollars um, to go towards abortions today. And so we need to stand strong in that regard. If you go to the bishop's website or even Catholic News Service, um, May 2021, you'll see uh, the the uh, uh, article, excuse me, uh, on the bishops urging Catholics to sign parish petitions against the uh, the Hyde Amendment's repeal. And the Church is very consistent in her teaching in this regard uh, on abortion and how we should not have our tax dollars going uh, to fund that. So great, great question and a very timely question as this bill is currently before Congress. Thank you so much. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Peggy in Daphne, Alabama, listening on Archangel Radio. Peggy, you are on with Father Wade. Thank you so much. Father Wade, it's good to talk to you. I've been to you as my confessor on many occasions at the shrine, and it's great to talk to you in person. My question is, for a dying person, the sacrament of the dying and the sacrament of apostolic pardon, what is the difference and how are they used? Okay, great question. So the apostolic pardon is part of the fullness of the last rites, huh? And the apostolic pardon is a complete remission of the temporal punishment due to already forgiven mortal and venial sin in the person's life. So the sins have been forgiven, that is their guilt, it's as though they never ever committed them. Why does a temporal punishment remain then? Well, because sin is messy. I've talked about this on on Open Line Tuesday before. There's four categorical consequences to personal sin whenever it's carried out, and those four categories are personal, social, ecclesial, and cosmic. So, for example, I could rob a bank and spend all the money, have great remorse after the fact, go confess the sin of having robbed the bank, okay? The guilt of that sin is forgiven, But then there's also the messiness that remains, the the temporal situation uh, remains of me having spent everybody's money, and there's no way for them to get their money back. So sin is messy. There's personal, social, ecclesial, and cosmic consequences to sin. And sin is always, always a personal act, even if it's carried out with another uh, in unison with another, for example, the sin of adultery, or, or I've used the example of, of Jack and I robbing a bank together. It's still a personal sin on my part. It's still a personal sin on his part. So uh, the temporal punishment remains, and what the apostolic pardon does, it completely removes that temporal punishment uh, for already forgiven mortal and venial sin if there's any remaining. There may not be any remaining if the person has offered their sufferings throughout life, if they've sought plenary indulgences, if they've sought the treasury of merits from the cross, which is the whole meaning of the doctrine of indulgences, which the apostolic pardon is a part of, right? And so uh, that that's important to remember as well. Uh, and so when we talk about the last rites, we mean the anointing of the sick, holy confession, if the person needs to go, they may not feel the need to go if they're not aware of any mortal sins, uh, holy viaticum, which is one's final holy communion, if they're able to receive it, they may not be able to receive it. For example, if they're in ICU because of a car accident and they have a lot of apparatus on them uh, and they're not able to receive uh, their final viaticum, their, the, receive viaticum, their final holy communion. Prayers of commendation for the dying is number four, which includes the litany of the saints. And the apostolic pardon is number five. Uh, which the priest confers upon the dying person when they are near death. So 
Uh, of those five, the anointing of the sick, confession, holy viaticum, prayers of commendation for the dying, and the apostolic pardon, there's two of the five that may not be received. Number one, confession, again, if the person feels they, they're not uh, they have no need to go, or they're not able to go because, again, they're in ICU, they have all kinds of apparatus on them, they're in a coma, either induced or natural, and they're not able to make a confession. In that sense, anointing of the sick doubles as confession for mortal sin. And the second thing of the five that they may not be able to receive uh, as a collective five would be the Holy Viaticum, one's final Holy Communion, uh, because, again, they may not be able to receive it. Uh, so so the apostolic pardon is tied to the doctrine of indulgences precisely because the apostolic pardon uh, completely removes all temporal punishment due to already forgiven mortal and venial sins, okay? And that's important. Now, where does this appear in the catechism? And rightly so, I might add, in the section on the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of reconciliation, holy confession, huh? And this is very beautiful that the doctrine of indulgences is included in that, in that section. Uh, an indulgence is the remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sin, whose guilt has already been forgiven, if mortal sin through the sacrament of penance and reconciliation, if venial sin, either through the sacrament of penance and reconciliation or through other ways. A properly disposed member of the Christian faithful can obtain an indulgence under certain prescribed conditions through the help of the church, the bride of Christ, which as the minister of redemption of her bridegroom, Jesus Christ, dispenses and applies with her authority granted by him the treasury of the satisfactions of Christ and the saints who have already won the crown that does not wither. Okay, and so we are now partaking in this. This is also dovetailing now with the doctrine of the communion of saints. The members of the church militant on earth receiving the sacraments, receiving the last rites, uh, which is part of the merits and treasury that the saints in heaven, the members of the church triumphant, have already attained, and which the members of the church suffering or the church penitent in purgatory hope to attain with assuredness because they are assured heaven. So it's, it's a very, very beautiful doctrine. Uh, an indulgence is partial if it removes a part of the temporal punishment due to sin, or plenary if it removes all punishment. And what dictates that is the church's um, uh, dictates on the particular spiritual actions involved. But for, the pl for, but for the apostolic pardon, it's a full remission. Okay, so I, I urge you to go to the section on the sacrament of penance and reconciliation in the catechism towards its end uh, is where the, the section on indulgences and, and the apostolic pardon as well is mentioned, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful section of the catechism. Thank you so much for a great question. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. That's the number Frank used on Long Island, New York, listening on the EWTN app. Frank, you're on with Father Wade. Hey, Father Wade. Um, just a quick question. Can the good works of someone in mortal sin be meritorious? They can, but not salvific nor redemptive. You, you, the physical act of doing something will still have its temporal effect, okay, here living on earth, but for the soul, no, because the mortal sin has to be forgiven. We have to uh, ask for forgiveness and be contrite. So confession, contrition, and satisfaction. This is strictly for mortal sin. There is sin that is deadly and sin that is not deadly. The, the New Testament is very clear about this truth, and this is the doctrine of mortal sin and venial sin that the Church teaches so eloquently and so beautifully. Uh, there is a difference between knowingly and willingly and wittingly uh, committing willful murder versus the seven-year-old who just entered the age of reason this seventh year of their life, uh, taking a pack of gum from the store behind mommy's back while mommy's purchasing her items at the checkout counter. Um, there's, there is sin that is deadly and sin that is not deadly. So, but remember, one can still receive actual graces while in a state of mortal sin. One cannot receive sanctifying graces, meritorious graces, that is, while in a state of mortal sin. So your question, uh, for the soul that's in, then in a state of mortal sin, and again, mortal sin is grave matter, fullness of knowledge, and done with deliberate consent of your will. If all three of those items are present, uh, you've committed a mortal sin. If any one or two of those is, is missing, you have a venial sin. 
So again, grave matter, meaning what? It seriously contravenes God's moral law, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, right? Uh, fullness of knowledge, number two. You have fullness of knowledge that this particular action contravenes God's moral law. And number three, you do it with deliberate consent of your will anyway. So grave matter done with fullness of knowledge and done with deliberate consent of your will. If all three are present and the mortal sin has been committed, it cuts off sanctifying grace, meritorious grace, redemptive, salvific grace for the soul. But one can still receive an actual grace. And those actual graces will come through the good works that they still continue to do and the devotional practices, etc., even while in a state of mortal sin, although not being salvific or redemptive, those actual graces from doing those things can aid them in getting back into a state of sanctifying grace, okay? So again, not for the works themselves, but for the charity they prosper. That's why we do the works. Not for themselves, but for the charity they prosper. And I want to finish this up when we come back from our break. 833-288-EWTN. It's Open Line Tuesday with Father Wade Menezes. Prayer has been so powerful in my communication with God, understanding the church better, most importantly, understanding the Lord better, and myself better. I heard it said once that God answers knee mail, as in K-N-E-E. -E. Prayer is powerful. One of the favorite things I love to do when it comes to prayer is to ask for the intercession of the great saints. Try it sometime. You'll be very, very impressed and surprised by the amazing power of prayer. And now, the EWTN Family Prayer with Father Joseph. Family, a prayer that we pray together is a powerful prayer. So please pray together with me, our EWTN Family Prayer. Today we pray for young people. Heavenly Father, we worship you, our Creator. You have brought each one of us into existence because of your loving generosity. Protect young people from the many snares of temptation that surround them. Shield them from drugs, fornication, self-indulgence, and sin. Lead them in the path of life and of true love. Surround them with angels to guard, defend, and guide them. Let none of them be lost but grant that they may fulfill your plans and find lasting happiness. Amen. This is Father Wade Menezes. If you missed part of today's show, catch the encore tonight at 10 Eastern and check out the podcast anytime at EWTNradio.net and click podcasts. How are your cooking skills? We'll talk about that next on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. On most of these EWTN stations. Now back to Open Line with Father Wade Menezes. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. We're talking to Frank on Long Island, New York, and Father Wade, we're talking about the um, meritorious uh, possibilities of uh, good works that are performed while someone is in a state of mortal sin. Correct. So, so for example, uh, when we're in a state of mortal sin, and we believe that we are because those three conditions have been fulfilled for a mortal sin to be present on the soul— that doesn't excuse us from our Sunday obligation of Mass, but it does excuse us until we can be reconciled to the sacrament of penance, the ordinary means of which mortal sin is forgiven. Uh, it does prevent us from receiving Holy Communion. It, it excuses us from receiving Holy Communion because we don't want to receive a sacrilegious communion. And that can be with a, a mortal sin that's just an occasional mortal sin or an ongoing state of mortal sin that's, that's manifest and, and even public manifest mortal sin. Uh, we refrain from confession, but it doesn't excuse us from our Sunday obligation Mass. And it could be from going to Mass regularly, even though we're not receiving Holy Communion, receiving actual graces from the Mass that eventually prompt us to go back to confession because of the homily on confession that we heard at that particular Mass that really urges us to go on and back to confession. And that's a beautiful thing. Maybe there's um, somebody who's been falling away from the church for five years uh, just through an immoral, illicit lifestyle. 
uh, maybe cohabitation, fornication, um, uh, contraception, and so forth. And, and, you know, despite all that, they at least have the know-how of a well-formed conscience to know that they shouldn't be receiving Holy Communion. But sadly, they haven't been going to church at all either because of all those sins in this five-year period, let's say, in this example I'm giving. So one day they're shopping at the grocery store, right? And they're with their grocery cart, and they're in aisle 16, and they're about to make the corner to aisle 17 where all the laundry detergent is. And they make the corner from 16 into 17 uh, with their grocery cart, and as soon as they make the corner into aisle 17, lo and behold, there's the local parish priest in his clerical suit buying a box of laundry detergent for the rectory. And that's an actual grace for that person, whether they recognize it or not. That's an actual grace. How many actual graces do we receive daily, whether we're already in a state of sanctifying grace with no mortal sin, or whether we're not receiving sanctifying grace because we are in a state of mortal sin? Because you can receive actual graces either way. That's another example of an actual grace, is when we run into a situation that prompts us, it gives us compunction of heart, it, it makes us uh, joyful yet sorrowful, sorrowful yet joyful, that I need to get back to practicing my faith of baptism. I want to get back to the sacraments. I want to get back to the Eucharist. So, so the actual graces are very, very important. Another thing about mortal sin, a state of mortal sin, when, when we commit a mortal sin, and, and, and we're, because we know our faith and we know the three elements are present, we too often think that I need to get to confession, and that's, that's a correct thought, by the way. That's a correct truth. I got to get to confession. But we don't make an act of contrition between the committing of the sin and getting to confession. We wait for confession to do it all. No, don't wait for confession to do it all. You want to make an act of contrition as soon as you've committed the mortal sin, and you want it to be a perfect act of contrition. What's a perfect act of contrition? It's a philosophical term in this sense. It means that you're most sorry for your sins, all your sins, mortal and venial, but especially this mortal sin now that you've just committed. You're especially sorry for it because it offends God, and then secondarily because it threatens you with eternal damnation. That's the perfect act of contrition. The imperfect act of contrition, again, used in a philosophical sense, that term imperfect, the imperfect act of contrition is the act of contrition that we say that we're most sorry for the sin because of what it threatens us with in regards to temporal punishment if venial sin or eternal punishment if mortal sin, okay? That's an imperfect act of contrition, and then secondarily only that it offends God. That's the imperfect act of contrition. No, no. When we commit a mortal sin, we want to make a perfect act of contrition as soon as possible and then get back to confession as soon as is reasonably possible uh, to get back in a state of sanctifying grace. We have the intellect, the will to pursue the good, the true, and the beautiful, and to shun evil and vice. This is part of being made in the image and likeness of God. And this is our calling through our baptism. This is our calling through our sacrament of confirmation. This is sustained by regular Eucharist. This is sustained by regular reconciliation. And these are the truths that we want to live by. These are the truths that we want to uh, uh, prosper and, and give to others and help uh, evangelize others with, especially those who have fallen away from the faith. So a great question on, on whether or not uh, act, certain actions, whether devotional or, or pious or, or sacramental, can they be meritorious in of themselves in regards to sanctifying grace while in a state of mortal sin? And don't forget to make the perfect act of contrition as soon as you realize that you've committed a state of mortal sin. I'm talking to everybody now. Uh, don't just wait for confession to do it all, huh? Uh, you don't know if you'll make it to that next confession. Maybe something will happen to you that you won't make it to that confession. You want to make that perfect act of contrition, uh, which should be part and parcel with the daily examination of conscience. This is why the, the, the particular exam done at midday and the general exam done at the end of the day uh, are such staple practices in, in, the, in the, the strongly lived Catholic Christian life, whether single, lay, uh, whether a single person, married person, whether a consecrated religious diocesan person, diocesan priest or, or deacon, uh, this is why the particular exam and the general exam are such a staple element of the daily lived spiritual life. Great question, Frank, from Long Island. Thank you so much. Next stop is Davisburg, Michigan. Steve is in the great state of Michigan listening on Ave Maria Radio. Steve, you're on with Father Wade. Hi, Father Wade, and uh, thank you for taking my call. I wanted to say thank you so much for answering God's call to serve him as a priest. You're a, you're a gift to me, a gift to the church, and as a convert, I can say 
I cannot believe how incredibly blessed we are to be Catholic Christians. I've received this uh, inexhaustible treasure chest from Jesus, our Lord. And uh, so, amen. So I had a question. uh, Is there anything wrong theologically or uh, from our Catholic faith to be reading the King James Version of the Bible? Okay, great question. You'll be missing some of the books from the Old Testament, six of them that the Catholics still, that the Catholic Church can, uh, includes in the canon of Scripture from the Council of Carthage in 397 AD. You're also going to be missing out on great commentary. Uh, for example, commentary that is made up of more recent scholars uh, like Dr. Scott Hahn and even uh, past scholars like the Church Fathers themselves, especially those from the first seven to eight centuries. So there's many, many good Catholic study Bibles out there diff- diff- that, that adhere to several versions of the Bible, whether it be uh, the the um, the second edition of the um, uh, uh, New American Bible, also the Revised Standard Edition of of the Bible, the Catholic edition of the re, it's it's the Revised C-E-R- Standard Version. Yeah. No, it's the Catholic edition of the Revised Standard Version. It's yeah. it's the C E R S V. That's what I was trying to say, and uh, and there's others. There's even the Dewey Rames that's done in a more modern modern translation. That's very very good. There's five that I really like to promote to people, and these come to us from Ascension Press, um, and they rank them here from the the top five, starting with number five and moving down to number one, with what Ascension Press believes is to be the best. So number five is simply titled The Catholic Study Bible. It's from Oxford University Press, and it includes the first one that I mentioned as far as translations go, the New American Bible Revised Edition. That's the N-A-B-R-E. It's the English translation. Number four is the Catholic Scripture Study Bible. The Catholic Scripture Study Bible, that's from St. Benedict Press, and that uses the same translation. Um, then there's the Didache Bible, uh, just released in 2015, a few years ago. Uh, it uses the RSV Second Catholic Edition translation of the Bible, which is the second one that Jack and I mentioned just now, the second translation, that is. Uh, number two is the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible from Ignatius Press. It also uses the Revised Standard Version, Second Catholic Edition. Uh, of the of the English translation of the Bible, and number one, the Great Adventure Catholic Bible, the Great Adventure Catholic Bible. All of these have great, great commentary. This number one that I just mentioned from the Ascension Press list, the Great Adventure Catholic Bible, has a lot of of modern scholarship of scriptural exegesis in it by Dr. Andrew uh, Swafford, Dr. Peter Williamson, Jeff Cavins, uh, Dr. Mary Healy, uh, and and others. So modern scholars that are teaching right now at at various uh, Catholic universities. Um, So those are five right there. If you go to Ascension Press's website at ascensionpress.com, and on the search bar, just put in the words study Bible, uh, these, this article on the f- top five that they recommend are right there. So, to, again, to echo my answer to your question, there's nothing wrong with reading the, RS, the, the um, King James Version of the Bible, except that you're missing out precisely as a Catholic. Now, what I would want to do as a Catholic convert uh, in, into the faith, uh, you, when you read the Church Fathers, you want to juxtapose with the King James Version how the Fathers saw this particular passage different from the scholarship that's given by the Protestant authors in the King James Version. So remember, you, you want to go as deep as you can into Scripture. Uh, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ, St. Jerome teaches. And so you want to delve more deeply, and we do this by the scholarship, the exegesis, not only the modern scholars, the, the good solid ones, but also the Church Fathers, even the lives of the saints throughout the, the, the history of the Church. And that's why I like the Navarre Bible, which is put out by Opus Dei, the Navarre Bible. Um, much of its commentary features predominantly the Church Fathers, again, of the first seven to eight centuries. But uh, many of the commentary, much of the commentary in the Navarre Bible uh, features just simple quotes of the saints on this particular packet passage. It could be a quote from St. Teresa of Avila, who lived in the 16th century, or St. John the Cross, who was a contemporary of hers. It could be from St. Alphonsus Liguori, a, a quote from him quoting on this uh, passage on the resurrection, uh, who lived in in the um, in the eighteenth century. So again, it's it's it, it's it's the whole picture of the saints, especially the church fathers and the modern day scholarship. So, if I were you, I would look at at that uh, article from Ascension Press and really examine those top five that they recommend. Thank you so much for a great question. 
God bless you, Steve. Thanks for the call. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Tomorrow on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie on the day before Thanksgiving, what a great topic for their program tomorrow. Do you like to cook? Do you like to cook? That's the question Jerry and Debbie are asking you tomorrow on Take Two, noon Eastern time right here on EWTN Radio. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America, 833-288-3986. Next up is Ellie in New York City watching us on YouTube today. Ellie, thanks for holding. Welcome to the program. Hi, Father Way. Hello, Ellie. Um, so this is my question. How do I answer to another Catholic um, that says that Jesus can be found in any faith? It doesn't necessarily have to be the Catholic. Okay, great question. Great question. Well, our Lord himself, Jesus Christ, founded a church, and he has provided her with all the tools necessary to ensure one on the right path to salvation, okay? Uh, St. Peter and St. Paul, especially in their New New Testament epistles, warn of false teachers, huh? And so we look to the authority of the church, the bride of Christ, and this is where we look to the faith of the church, which we're given as a gift through the sacrament of baptism, huh? And then it grows as we grow. Uh, Faith is one of the three theological virtues, along with hope and love, or hope and charity. It is a gift of God and a human act by which the believer gives personal adherence to God who invites that same person's response back. And the person freely assents to what? He assents to the whole truth, the whole truth that God has revealed. Through what? Through sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium, the teaching office of the church. And in this total composite of revelation through scripture, tradition, and the magisterium, Uh, It is in this revelation of God which the church proposes for our belief and which we know through those three legs of what I call the three-legged stool, sacred scripture, tradition, the magisterium, and which we profess in the creed, the Nicene Creed, which we recite and pray in congregation every Sunday at Mass, which we celebrate also in the seven sacraments, which we live by right conduct that fulfills the twofold commandment of charity to love both God and neighbor, as specified in the Ten Commandments. The first three commandments have to do with love of God. The remaining seven have to do with love of neighbor, beginning with honor thy father and thy mother, because even though they're your parents, they're also your neighbor. They're your fellow human being, right? And also to respond in our prayer of faith through strong devotional practices. Okay, so these are just some of the elements, huh? Some of the elements by which we know uh, the, the, the truth that Jesus has provided for us through his bride, the church. Now, everything that's proposed through scripture, tradition, and the magisterium uh, is, is contained in what's called the sacred deposit of faith. Now, the catechism gives us a very, very telling definition of the deposit of faith. And it's at this point that I want all of our Open Line Tuesday listeners to put on their seatbelts, okay? Because this is, this is pretty, pretty heavy, okay? Uh, the deposit of faith is the heritage of the faith contained in sacred scripture and tradition handed on in the church from the time of the apostles from which the magisterium, that is the teaching office of the church, draws all that it proposes for belief as being divinely revealed by God, thus helping the faithful turn away from any path of error. That's a very, very telling paragraph in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, okay? Very, very telling paragraph. The Church wants to protect us from error and from the the going down the wrong path. And so going back to your question then, uh, for for those friends of yours who say that as long as you believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter what faith, no, our, our Lord founded a church with His plan, and that church is His bride, which carries out the bridegroom's plan. And we know this through the three-legged stool, again, of Scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. We profess in the creed, which has some 40-plus truths. I count 47 truths in the creed, the Nicene Creed, depending on how you break them up, which we celebrate in the seven sacraments, which we live by right conduct and the pursuance of the good, the true, and the beautiful, um, by which we develop 
further in through, through uh, appropriate piety and devotion and acts of good works, not for the works themselves, but for the charity, they prosper, etc. And so this is, this is why we look to the fullness of faith in the church, which by the way, we know by her four marks, right? The one true church that our Lord founded, she is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Uh, those are four truths of the 47 truths that I discover in the creed. She is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. We know her by those four marks. She is the plan that God himself, through his incarnate Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, has given us to pursue the truth and to arrive at salvation by loving God and by loving our neighbor, expressed through the life of living the church herself on earth, and the, you know her sacraments, again, her, her truths, etc. So this is what you want to convey, that we know the one true church, to your friends, you want to convey that we know the one true church by her four marks and all that she proposes and, and as, as necessary for salvation through her scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. Great question. Thank you so much. Next stop, the great state of North Dakota. Jacob is in North Dakota listening on Real Presence Radio. Jacob, you're on with Father Wade. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Uh, You're you welcome. mentioned that split. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that split in Advent on December sixteenth, and I've been thinking about this a little bit. And I know that the Annunciation on March twenty fifth uh, celebrates the Incarnation, but I'm wondering: has there ever been consideration of a feast that celebrates the Incarnation of Jesus during Advent? And I was wondering, on particularly December 16th, which would be nine days before Christmas, which would uh, represent those nine months before Jesus was born, uh, because I think that that would, um, having a separate feast for the incarnation of Jesus Christ, especially um, in today's scientific, more scientific world, would better clarify when the Word became flesh. Because when I hear that reading at Christmas, uh, you know, you have people that think that that people become um, humans when they're born. And um, I just think that perhaps a, a feast, a separate feast celebrating the incarnation of Jesus Christ, would better signify the, um, when Jesus became flesh um, at the incarnation. Yeah, great question. And, and uh, your, your thought process there is, is a good one. Uh, the, we do not celebrate the Incarnation per se during Advent, because Advent focuses on the two comings of Christ, which leads us to have introspection on our own uh, particular judgment when Christ will come to us to judge us. Uh, and because we celebrate the Sacred Incarnation on March 25th of every year, also called the Annunciation, meaning the announcement uh, of the Archangel Gabriel to Mary when he asked her if she would be the mother of God. Um, so, so notice that March 25th is precisely nine months to the day before December 25th. So we celebrate the Sacred Incarnation on March 25th every year on the Church's Universal Calendar. It's classified as a feast, uh, not a solemnity, but a feast. And uh, it's also referred to as uh, the Annunciation, as I said. Uh, as well as the Sacred Incarnation, March 25th. And so that's why we don't celebrate it per se in Advent, along with the second reason of Advent focusing on the two comings of Christ. So the first two-thirds of Advent focus on his second coming as the just and merciful judge. The, the last third of Advent, mainly from December 17th through December 23rd, when we have the great O antiphons, we focus with a great liturgical shift in the readings beginning on December 17th, focusing on his first coming. And there's a great quote from St. Augustine that says, let us not forget Christ's first coming precisely so that we do not regret his second coming. Let us not forget Christ's first coming precisely so that we do not regret his second coming. So great, great question. The church does celebrate it, not during Advent per se, the Sacred Incarnation, and it's for those two reasons. We celebrate on the 25th of, of, of March every year as a feast, and secondly, to not take away from the focus of Advent, which is on the two comings of Christ and also our own particular judgment. This is why I study the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, referred to as the Church's eschatology, from the Greek word eschaton, meaning the last. 
It's a great time to renew our fervor and our love for the doctrine of the church's eschatology, the study of the last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, three of which will apply to each one of us personally. Great question. Thank you so much. And I want to recap from the previous question. I didn't give the catechism number. Uh, It's catechism number 890. It says, the task of the magisterium especially of the church is to preserve God's people from deviations and defections of the truth in order to guarantee them the objective possibility of professing the one true faith without error. And this mission of the magisterium, the teaching office of the church, is linked to the definitive nature of the covenant established by God with his people in Jesus Christ, who came in the flesh. Number 890 of the Catechism. Two great questions. Again, thank you so much. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Next up is Christian in Allentown, Pennsylvania, listening to... The Open Line Podcast. Christian, you're on with Father Wade. Hey, Father Wade, this is your nephew. (laughs) Hello, Christian, another nephew. This isn't the one driving, this isn't either of the two driving home from uh, college today, everybody. This is another nephew. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, uh, as you know, I work in the medical field here in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and a question I've been meaning to have you kind of talk about or ask about is uh, one that we encounter a lot uh, for end-of-life or palliative conversations. Um, you know, when should sure. we consider what, what are the church's values and, and teachings on doing uh, nutrition and hydration through artificial means, you know, through the belly, feeding tubes, and things sure. like that, um, aside from ordinary means? Great question. I wish I had more time to answer it. It's, it's, it's 2.52, but I'll, I'll just give a summation of it. The church teaches that we are always bound to give ordinary means of care to the sick person. We are never bound to give extraordinary means. But hydration and nutrition are considered part of the ordinary means, always. If, for example, the, the nutrition, whether it be through solid food, soft food, or intravenous uh, liquid food, n- nutrients, and so forth, as long as the body can process it, the body should be able to process it. Uh, and then the church puts great credence in the expertise of doctors, uh, two to three opinions. Uh, the, 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 the lay faithful for their loved one are, are, are welcome to receive from two to three doctors' opinions on, on what the doctors believe the stages the loved one is currently at. For example, when my own father died, your own grandfather, a Christian, you know that at one point he wasn't even a, uh, permitted to receive uh, anything intravenous in the last two and a half days, precisely because the body simply couldn't process it, okay? The, the belly was, was expanding and so forth. So the hospice that was ascend, assisting the family at that time knew that the time was near. So in that juncture, we held the nutrition food uh, intravenously as, uh, to, the, to the point or juncture that we were able to, that he could still process it. But it, at one point, we finally had to just cease it because the belly was expanding again and so forth. So otherwise, though, nutrition and hydration... Uh, are always considered part of normative, ordinary palliative care, along with clean bedclothes on the body, clean bedclothes in the bed like sheets, a regular moistening and salving of the lips and tongue, etc. Those are all ordinary means. Extraordinary means uh, is, a, is another topic uh, that we can talk about at another time. But great question. Thank you so much. Father, would you leave us with a blessing? I certainly will, Jack. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon all of our Open Line Tuesday listeners and remain with each and every one of you this day and always. And Happy New Year's this coming Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. Pray for us on behalf of our host, Father Wade Menezes, producer Michael McCall, call screener Matt Kubensky, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in to Open Line Tuesday. Back at it tomorrow with Father Mitch. Until then, God bless. How are you listening to EWTN Radio right now? Have you ever wished you could listen on a local radio station? Maybe our Lord is speaking to your heart to help make that happen. Don't let a lack of experience hold